great privilege to get to know Heidi Wolf a little bit over the course of this year. I met her through Jeff, Jeff Pettis at the at USDA Beltsville. Um, you know I love me and urban beekeeper, right? And when I was contacted by Dr. Pettis, who was impressed enough with Heidi's research topic, which is comparison of the nutritional resources available to urban versus rural beekeepers. We're still very early in this study, but every beekeeper asks themselves, are my bees getting enough to eat? Can I keep bees here? What is the difference between putting a bee in a location like this versus a location like that? And Heidi's research is beginning to work in exactly that, that area. This is her first presentation to a state club. And she is a um, combination BSMS student in the biology department at George Washington University. I'm sorry I got that wrong in the newsletter. But she's also a dad hand and worked while well, having around. She helped us take down a bee tree downtown and, and try to save some really cool genetics this summer. And I would love you to really welcome Heidi Wolf to GW. videos for beekeeping, which I share with the public, and uh, I want to do more of these projects. Uh, I kind of be like Tony and when I grow up, and I want to do more of these things in the future, and um, so hopefully that will happen. And I also like art, so all the stuff that you see, I, I made too. So at the beginning of this year, I worked with my advisor, Dr. Dobo, to start our bee lab. Uh, I took an introductory uh, biology lab, and turn into a honeybee research facility. Um, as you might imagine, we don't have much funding, so I do everything by hand. <coughs> and I strove to make the lab uh, both attractive and accessible to the incoming student researchers, and of course myself. Um, and we currently have seven students in the lab. Uh, I made a short course on honeybees and beekeeping for the students to have as a reference, and I teach each one how to keep bees. Um, you know the saying, ask 10 beekeepers, get 12 answers, and we all think ours is the best, and I have no exception to this, so I teach them what I like. Um, and we added this observation hive to the lab, not only to gather interest um, from the students, but we're also currently working on a lab module uh, to teach introductory biology students about social insects, and we're namely going to be looking at the waggle dance. Um, this lab module will involve an embarrassing video of me and another student uh, in unflattering bee costumes doing the waggle dance, and um, I'll use that in my education outreach programs as well. Uh, and I'll share that once we make that, if you want to laugh at it. Um, we'll put it on the website. Great. 
<laughs> and this is just an image from our observation hive that I got uh, recently of the queen receiving short glances. I just like that picture. And this is the entrance to our uh, observation hive in the lab. And there's the design that I just made this year that I'm really fond of. And here's uh, an image of Dr. Doble with some students doing some frame construction. Um, one of the major things that I did when I was still active duty to allow me to be a beekeeper still was to go to the local beekeeper association and just say, I can lift a full honey super, I can make all this stuff, and that's pretty much all I did. I was kind of like the, you know, the slave of the group, but um, now I have help, so it's fantastic. And this is uh, Dr. Harvard Doble. He's always helpful and jolly and uh, has an endless supply of endless um, awesome insect t-shirts, which I really enjoy. <laughs> And this is a, an image, um, just for sentimental value, really. Uh, one of the joys of being a beekeeper is looking at the postman's face when they want to get rid of your bees. And this was a particularly good one. Um, they were actually on time with letting me know that my package has arrived, which is amazing. Um, and this is uh, a couple of the six that I received from the Founding Farmers Restaurant um, that is providing me with a scholarship for my research. So I'm very grateful to them. This is my fiance, uh, Fazl Rahman. He's here with me today, and he helps me with the bees more than anyone else. I hurt my back over the summer, even when I'm, you know, boasting about how much I can lift. And he has become really knowledgeable and really knows how to do beekeeping, even though his face might not say it. He really does. <laughs> and this is him learning how to use the equipment. Um, note how he tied his veil. He improvised that. <laughs> But uh, he's learning quickly, and Scott Seacomb told him how to really do it. He's our good friend, and he always teaches us new stuff. I, I continue to learn new things with beekeeping. You know, you can start yesterday or 12 years ago, and you still always learn something new. And um, making videos really helps with that, because you're, wow, that was so stupid. I can't believe I just did that. But Scott is also really good at that, too. <laughs> so this is an image of um, the from the top down of my uh, roof apiary on Listener Hall, uh, which is at the intersection of G and 21. And I'm at the, the roof entrance, and I'm looking down at the sixth floor. And that's a student uh, and Faz there helping bring up my stuff. And this is a couple of students putting on bee suits for the first time. Um, <laughs> and they got excited. Uh, Big Evening continues to provide excitement, interest, and a unique experience for the students, and they've been coming back, which is great. And I, of course, always enjoy it as well. There's Faz, the unsung hero. And this is me just showing a student how to inspect a, a frame, which is pretty much, if you can't do that, you're stuck in the mud with beekeeping. So this is one of the most important things, the first thing that I show students. And this is the view from our Bell Hall uh, roof, where we just have one hive. Um, and this is from our listener hall roof, where we have a much better view. And you can see we were just setting up the first two of our larger apiary, first two hives. And that was at the beginning of this year, actually. And this is me um, handling bees without a suit. And I look very happy. That's how I prefer to do it but I've been getting a really strong skin reaction lately, so I've been wearing a suit because Dr. Doble knows that I work alone a lot, and he doesn't want me stuck on the roof, and no one knows. Um, and here I am teaching a student about bee space, which is always important. And now on to my research. Um, here we have an image of my bees up close with some pollen, and this was taken in the early spring. And in this image I took, I was it was difficult to get, but I was trying to get an image that shows a bunch of the different color varieties. And there's a couple right in the center there that are particularly bright and, and lovely. And um, you can see that the pollen baskets have the different varieties of colors. And, and this is what's at the heart of my hypothesis. Um, the study focuses on researching the differences between the urban and rural environment. Uh, namely, looking at three different things. Um, pollen biodiversity, uh, protein content, and pesticide content as well. Um, so to just give a little intro of what we're going to do, the biodiversity will be uh, sorted by doing this, uh, excuse me, start over. The biodiversity will be um, determined by sorting the pollen pellets from the pollen baskets 
into groups. And you can use a pollen color identification key to get an idea, an estimate of how many plants they're visiting at that given time. And with the protein analysis, we'll be using the Bradford assay technique, which is, just helps you get an idea of how much protein. And for the, um, the pesticide analysis, we'll be outsourcing that with the help of the USDA to the um, Agriculture Marketing Services Laboratory in Gastonia, North Carolina. The name of my study is Urban Versus Rural Apiaries, an Observational Study of Pollen uh, Quality and Content. And so what I'm going to do now is show you a series of GIS images that show my collection sites as I explain the experimental procedure, which can be a little dry, so I want to give all my pictures. Um, the bright green arrow indicates the pollen collection site, and I'll show you two images for each site so you can get an idea of what they look like. And uh, as Tony mentioned, please note that I'm still conducting this experiment, so I will explain my procedure, what I'm doing now, and what it will be. So uh, pollen was collected from six urban sites within Washington, D.C. and six uh, rural sites within the greater metropolitan area. And uh, the pollen traps were obtained from the USDA Bee Research Lab. And they were placed on the hive and secured with duct tape. Though I was just talking with Wayne and he said there's a much easier way, which I need to learn. Uh, because duct tape is a bear to work with in the summer. Um, so, and this, uh, the duct tape restricts the sole entry through the pollen trap in the, that weird little shape, and it strips off about 50% of the corbicular pollen. So it's, it's still allowing them to get the, pro, the, the protein from the pollen all that. It's only three days anyways. But um, that's how we collect it. They're, if you haven't seen a pollen trap before, it's kind of like a plastic front porch that goes on the hive, and so it just it's, should be easy to attach. Um, so they were deployed over a period of three days, and this allowed for ample pollen collection so that we can analyze it. And this process was repeated uh, later in the season as well. So the first collection period was from August 3rd to the 5th, and then from September 9th to the 11th. Um, I imagine I will repeat this study and would like to include more trials, so earlier in the spring instead of just late summer and end of season. Each collection site will have uh, one hive sampled, and there will be two collection sites that will have four at each one. And this is to uh, observe inner apiary differences and variation. Um, the higher sample size will allow for that. And at the end of each of the two sampling periods, uh, the pollen pellets were stored in uh, plastic bags at negative 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, so for the first analysis, the pollen biodiversity, uh, a five gram random subsample of the pollen collected from each hive is visually sorted, like I said, with the pollen key. And we weigh each one to get a rough estimate, though it is difficult uh, in each of the trials. I had to either reschedule for rain, or we got a different amount, or a trap fell off, or so there's always going to be variation, so that won't be a very conclusive thing, but just for our records to know how much there actually was of each type. And for the second, the protein content, as I said before, we'll be using the, the Bradford assay. Um, and this is this is done, um, we're, we're debating how, how we want to do it. Do we want to do it for each individual pollen type, or do we want to do a lump sum for each collection site? And right now we're doing it with the pollen type, but I would imagine it could be more feasible just to do the lump sum. So from this area, how much protein are they getting? Um, and I think that'll be a little more feasible with the time constraints that we have. And for the pesticide content, again, that's going to be outsourced uh, with the help of the uh, USDA and we'll be going to North Carolina. And that's going to help us sample for the 170 commonly used pesticides. Um, I think they do it, someone here will probably know the answer to this, but I think they do it every couple of years. If a pesticide doesn't show up, they don't necessarily look for it. Um, or they stop looking for it until it shows up again. Uh, and that's because pesticide analysis is very expensive. And so due to that, due to my financial constraints, which are very small, um, we're only going to be analyzing the pesticide of one of the trials. Um, and so we'll save the rest uh, for maybe if I get a grant or that sort of thing. So that 
that's unfortunate, but that's what grants are for. And so the, the statistical analysis will be used uh, simple linear regression, and the, um, the urban and rural sites will be compared in an attempt to gain understanding of the environmental differences be between the two urban and rural environments. And uh, information generated by the previously mentioned analysis will be subject to further statistical analysis to determine whether or not differences in expression are statistically significant between rural and urban apiaries. Because I have this great idea that, yes, in the cities it will be better because there's, we think, I think, I think Tony also agrees, that there might be an increased pollen flow, honey flow, all these things because of the variety of plants that are there. Uh, whether it be in window boxes, rooftop gardens, community gardens, regular landscaping, especially in a city like DC where we have tons of fruit trees and things are constantly manicured. Um, that's not to say that there isn't a variety of plants in a rural environment, but I think it's going to be better in, a, in an urban, I'm hopeful. Um, so, for the results obtained from the biodiversity of the pollen analysis, a Shannon Wiener index uh, will be performed. And this index uh, measures the biodiversity. And it's advantageous not only because it takes into the account of the number of species, but the species abundance as well. So this is going to come into, when we take that subsample, the variety, but how many are there of each type as well. And results obtained from this, um, of the protein and pesticide content analysis will be used with the analysis of variance tests or ANOVA. Um, and I already said this is uh, focusing on the differences between the urban and rural environment, and so I have to keep that in mind even though I'm biased towards one. Um, expected results from the three analysis will be as follows. If urban environments should prove to have a greater biodiversity of pollen, which in turn would indicate uh, a higher biodiversity of available plants for the bees to obtain pollen from, this would imply increased nutrition or health. But you can't directly say that without doing a study on that. This is just an observational study of what's there, what do they have access to. And for the protein content analysis, it's expected that the protein of uh, urban pollen uh, which comes from greater breadth and variety of plants, will be greater than that of rural areas. One noteworthy thing, um, you might be aware of some studies that show what's better, biodiversity or protein content. And you'll find that even if you have one source that has amazing protein content, which is great for development, it's the biodiversity and it's the variety of your diet that is more important. And that, only, that also ties into uh, susceptibility to pesticide sensitivity, uh, infections. Um, some papers have shown uh, less infection of nosema, things like that. And finally, it's expected that due to the decreased use of pesticide in urban environments, the pesticide residue levels from the pollen will be lower than from that of a rural environment. Though, I will say, uh, Dr. Jeff Pettis told me recently that he was working with the EPA about studies of homeowners who do their own pesticide use, which is astronomical compared to commercial agriculture use. So that kind of throws a wrench in things, but we'll see. Um, one of the most common problems with that, and this might be a, a point of further research for me with him as well, is uh, people spraying for grubs in their yard. This is a very common thing, um, and people kind of take it seriously. You don't want to spray regularly, so you spray a lot, that sort of thing. So that might cause a problem. And these expected results lend themselves to the idea that cities and urban landscapes contain not only a greater breadth and width of diet for the bees, but decreased pesticide exposure as well compared to a rural environment. So kind of the same thing. Um, if urban apiaries do indeed have these benefits, results will support the idea that urban environment may be a useful resource for bolstering uh, healthier honeybee populations and lending support to the rise in urban agri agriculture and apiculture. And awareness overall. <laughs> this uh, study will show the potential of an urban environment and its ability to bolster pollinators. 
And so while it's only a preliminary investigation into the pollen differences between urban and rural apiaries, it will provide the groundwork for not only increasing the use of urban spaces, green space, and the role of nutrition and honeybee health, but perhaps further insight and groundwork for um, combating colony collapse disorder as well. And so these next few images, I'm just going to show you the rest of the collection sites, um, just so you can get an idea of where they are. This was done with the help of uh, Victor Levi, who's not here, but he really helped me out big time with that. So that part concludes my discussion on the research methods, but I want to show you a few more images just to see if anyone else had some issues this summer. Um, this was the storm just before the 4th of July, and Foz and I went up to our roof to see if the bees needed more bricks on top of the hives, and so we went there trying to beat the storm, but the storm had beat us, and there it goes, and we went up to the top to put the bricks on, and this is what we found. Um, you can see in the center there, those were the more newly established hives. Uh, they got put in later. They might as well be empty, you can see. But the other ones that were more propolized made it through, thank goodness. Uh, there were some frames that were kicked 50 feet from these hives. Um, but, Foz was there to help me, thank goodness. And we got them all back together uh, by the time the sun went down. And then most of them, we lost one hive uh, to it. It was just completely obliterated. Um, and now we have all of the back, but we did lose that one. So this is the new design that we have, and everyone's happy and prepared for winter now. Um, and so that concludes my discussion. If you have any questions. I have well, two questions. One to flip back the picture, and you said these are ready for winter? My, these, these current hives are ready for winter now. Oh, they're ready for winter now, now as they sit right there. No, ma'am. Okay. Okay, because I was going to say there's queen excluders on them, but you wouldn't have those on for winter. Uh, that's actually not a queen excluder. That's the inner cover. We are feeding them sugar on top. Another question. What is your population count per square mile in what you consider a rural area and a urban area? Because to me, that the rural areas you had, there's more houses with manicured lawns than there are, I mean, I'm from Washington County, and, and that, that looked like the middle of downtown to me, <laughs> you know, with all those houses. Right. I'm thinking, what what kind of a, of a uh, population growth do you have within a square mile of what you consider rural, and what you consider rural as opposed to urban? Are you talking about human population? I sure am. Okay. So that was not taken into context of how many people live in the certain square mile. How, of, how did you distinguish between rural and urban then? Uh, based on GIS information of the amount of green to pavement. Okay. So how much available plant area is there to paved or covered area. But in, in what you're considering a rural area, it looked like it was all, all mowed lawns. And yeah, they're green, but a mowed lawn that somebody has true cap come in and spray for dandelions and clover is not rural. That's well you know, let's look at a couple. It's a, yeah, it's a urban. It's a urban. <laughs> you know, and right there where you have Beltsville, that's fine, but if you go into the square mile around Beltsville, all you're gonna find is shopping centers and in, in, in uh, urbanization. That's right. The, you know that that <laughs> shot there looks like it's in the middle of the wilderness, but everybody knows that Beltsville sits in the middle of a town, so to speak. I, I understand your point, but given the context of my study uh, in the Washington metropolitan area, this is as rural as you're going to get, and it is by definition rural. So comparing urban to rural is literally this. Uh, ideally, if you would like one done in Montana, that would be completely different, but that would be even a wild environment. Howard, Howard, Frederick, Carroll, Washington County, anything outside of Montgomery County or Prince George's County, I would consider, or Baltimore County, I would consider a lot more rural than staying in Montgomery and Prince George's. Well, uh, it is only me doing the study, so I have time 
and money and uh, transportation constraints. So this is my role. Yeah. Different color uh, pollen when your sacks have been coming in. Mm -hmm. And you said there's a color chart that will determine what plant or what tree they're getting their pollen from. Is there plants or trees that have the same pollen or color that you could say, well, this is over here was a dandelion, this is over here was a, uh, a um, flowering tree, some kind of flowering tree or whatever. It, is there pollen from different things of the same color? Absolutely, and it's, it's actually pretty difficult to determine. I did one in the regular lab lighting and I got four piles of colors. And then I thought, well, no, maybe I should do this in better lighting. And I thought, oh, okay, I have more than four. So uh, with regards to the pollen color identification keys, there is light green, lemon yellow, uh, light yellow, dark yellow. It's, it's actually quite difficult. So it gives you more of a broad estimate. Um, if you're going to, if you want it down to species level, maybe you do PCR or send it off to a pollinologist which is also expensive. So this is just an, a rough estimate. But you're absolutely right. It's, it's difficult to determine the color differences. Okay. I'm a landscape architect by profession, and we do a lot of environmental work. One of the things that we use as a tool is the USGA so soil survey map. In that soil survey map, have aerial um, topography, mm -hmm. um, as well as, as, well as um, the type of canopy coverage and the species that are listed within that geographic region and even down to the zip code and the street so you could specifically take that address <coughs> and determine generally what type of canopy coverage, whether it be um, canopy, understory, whatever, mm -hmm. um, that they could be pulling um, pollen from. So when you're doing your pollen heat, you can have a general idea from each area. That would be really helpful, and that, that's um, that's a really good point. For example, the the lady who runs um, Leslie, who runs the community garden at the Whit Building on the mall, she wants to give me a plant list of her garden to see are the bees actually going there? Um, is that actually you know serving purpose beyond looking nice? Um, so that's a really a really good point. Yeah, the USGA um, survey maps are free. And you can just ask your USGA Extension Office, and they have one for every single county, including the city. Is there a, a website available for this? Because I was—that's what I was trying to do uh, with the GIS—is get a yeah. uh, an updated thing that I don't have to they, they go have, to the office. They have for. an office right across um, on Route 50 mm -hmm. before you get to the bridge. Next to the McDonald's is on the right. Mm -hmm. There's like this two-story. Um, business office complex and it's it's right in there. I can send you their address if you'd like and Great. you Thank can you. pick it up there for free. Um, uh -huh. They probably have it online at this point in time, but you know, we haven't seen it. We always rely on the text right. uh, because they don't update it very regular. It's irregularly yeah. updated. Yeah, that's but why I like the GIS. Yeah. It's very useful. Thank you. Any other questions? <coughs> <coughs> My question is about how uh, It's well, even though I too am biased in favor of urban foraging, your pesticide assays are not going to uncover um, particulate matter or the impact of air pollution, are they? No. Yeah. I just felt like I had to be fair. It might be res uh, there might be residues that might you know I wouldn't I don't want to say no entirely if, if it falls on there and it has a enough substance on there for it to be detected but probably not <laughs> any other questions yes ma'am uh, when do you expect to be finished your research well it has to be finished uh, by the end of the year um, because I'll be presenting the findings in the spring well that's what I'm interested in I'd really love to hear Wonderful. Uh, maybe Tony can, can invite you back <laughs> to give a presentation. I think I could be influenced. That would be great. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much.
you. Okay. For our business meeting, where is our secretary? Over Judge Hunt? While she's doing that, Bob, you want to come up and give the uh, da, 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 yeah. finance report? 